So uh, good afternoon, everyone. Um, thanks for joining this Wednesday lunchtime for the latest in our climate action sustainability uh, webinars for our lunchtime series. Um, it's great to have you join us for once again, or perhaps for the first time, if you're new to the series. Uh, this is number eight of 12. And um, uh, if you're new, then you can catch our recordings. They're available on the site that you've registered on, on our Trinity website. And indeed, um, to keep up with the future ones, you just have to register and keep track of, of, of that site and, and you'll receive emails. So thanks for joining everyone um, today. Um, just again, um, for those more new to it, we're just all about sharing knowledge and perspectives. That's what we're trying to do here in Trinity. Um, um, we have a, a range of our leading academics in, in, in fields across the university, providing their their perspective, their knowledge, sharing it. And, um, and we're having great discussions at the end of each session around how our work addresses national and global challenges. Um, and indeed, um, really enjoy the dialogue at the end of every session. So please encourage you all, you're welcome to ask questions um, uh, of our speaker. And we'll close up a few minutes before two to make sure that you have a little bit of a breather before back to the desk or perhaps move maybe step away from the desk for a few minutes. So um, something I encourage our speakers and, and uh, I think Phil has these included in, in his talk today is just setting the scene, our national priorities around climate action. Um, uh, this specifically is de detailed priorities in our climate action plan for 2023 and then obviously we have to look at the, the bigger global sense as well and the SDGs are, are a good matrix for that to consider how each one of us individually um, um, works to, uh, and our research and our practice and our teaching aligns with these specific uh, goals and so it's my great pleasure today um, to invite um, Professor Philip Lawton who is um, in the uh, Department of Geography our School of Geography in, in Trinity College. Um, uh, Phil and I started around the same time in Trinity um, and uh, have crossed paths. He's, he's director of the MSC and the Smart and Sustainable Cities. And his work, I suppose, uh, may be well defined in his talk, which is titled Protecting Our Urban Future, Density, and Density Intensity and Ideals. So, uh, Phil, if you're uh, ready to, to go, I'll happily hand over to you. Thanks, John. I'll just share my screen. Yeah, let me stop sharing. And as Phil is preparing, um, please, everyone, if you're familiar or not so familiar with the system, um, there's a Q&A button at the bottom. Please add your ask and add your questions as we go. And later, just raise your hand and I'll happily invite you to, to um, turn on your mic and ask the question as well. Otherwise, I'll be the one, the uh, kind of, being the middle person for the for the question. So Phil, over to you, looking forward to the, the, the presentation. Um, we'll uh, have a chat during the discussion at the end. Thank you. Great, thanks very much, John. Thanks for the invite for this and uh, looking forward to uh, going through some of my research interests and uh, outlining what I've titled here, projecting our urban future density, intensity and ideals. Um, John, as he just mentioned, asked us to kind of situate what we were gonna talk about in terms of uh, the climate action plan of 2023. Um, as perhaps will become apparent as, as we go through, as I go through the talk, for me, this is, is quite a challenge in terms of talking about the relationship essentially between urbanism, so ideals of urbanism, uh, ideals of changing cities that go right back, as, as I'll discuss, to the 1960s, uh, but bringing us up to today as well. Uh, and some of these key challenges in terms of sustainability uh, and I was tempted to, to colour in all of John's uh, examples here and the basis that for me in terms of my work and then also in terms of the way in which a lot of research is talking about urbanisation at the moment uh, through various diff different iterations, we're talking about a set of processes that are global in terms of their, in terms of their reach. Uh, but I, I resisted the urge to, to uh, colour them all in uh, as I felt it might cause a little bit of confusion in terms of what exactly I was going to talk about. But certainly that relationship between renewables, building better, so new and better types of building uh, from a social perspective for me are really crucial here. Transforming how we travel, so mobility, choices of mobilities, politics of mobilities, and how all of this then relates to, to land use and, and the political and social uh, dimensions of this are really crucial. Um, 
I will ground what I'm talking about uh, in, in the Irish context towards the end of the talk. So I'll keep it quite broad in terms of general discussions and debates for quite a, a lot of the discussion uh, that, that, that I'm, I'm, I'm going to carry out. Uh, but I will bring it back to talk about a specific example very briefly uh, towards the end. As John also alluded to as well, then uh, in turn, from a global perspective, perspective the uh, Sustainable Development Goals uh, in focus. So again, you know, kind of a number of really kind of key issues raised by urbanization. You know, it's kind of almost cliched at this stage, the sort of tilt tilting of the balance between rural and urban uh, in 2006, you know, the sort of 50% and then going towards 70% as we approach kind of the, as we get into this further into the century. But there's some essential elements in terms of the urban and the urban future, you know, poverty, decent work and economic growth, the way in which cities relate to land, both in terms of the city itself, but also how it relates to the planet more gener generally. And so these are of key importance. And then, and what I'll talk about a lot, I suppose, is kind of situated within this idea of sustainable communities. And as, as John mentioned, I run the MSC in Smart and Sustainable Cities. And, you know, we're, we're really, in terms of the student groups that we've had so far, it's really interesting to see those young minds engage in the challenges of sustainability in new ways. And then also the, that relationship between consumption and production as number 12 indicates there being of key importance as well, of being essential in terms of how we understand cities. Okay, so just to give a little bit of background, uh, I'm trained as a human geographer, uh, I suppose more particularly, I might describe myself as an urban geographer. Uh, and I've been interested for quite a long time in what I would summarize as the politics of urban social change. Uh, this started with a focus on public space during my PhD, then looking at, you know, so in, in that context, looking at the transformation of public spaces such as Trafalgar Square in London, Peckham Square in London as well, then Dam Square in Amsterdam, Mercator Plain in Amsterdam, and then also in the Irish context, places like O'Connell Street and, and, and Smithfield as well. And in a way that brought me into a kind of a broader kind of interest, you know, into urban residential change. So looking at places like Smithfield, for example, contextualizing public space in terms of wider ideals of urban change, urban social change. Uh, and then also, I've kind of broadened out. And, and one of the things I'm, I'm really interested in is that relationship between wider processes of suburbanization and the transformation of central cities over the last sort of 30 or 40 years. And I, as I go on in the next slide, uh, recently my interests have extended a little bit further back in time, and, and, and I'll detail that in a second. Um, throughout all of this, I've been very interested in discourses of urbanism. Uh, and I suppose there's a number of different ways in which we can define what, what it is we mean by urbanism. In this context, I'm, I'm interested in urbanism as a set sets of practices. Uh, and so I'm interested in the approaches of policymakers, planners, architects, but also, and increasingly over the last number of years, the ways in which different debates take place, whether it be in social media or other outlets, in terms of transforming our cities. Uh, and so there has been, a, you know, I think it's fair to say there has been a spike and a really interesting and a really worthwhile spike in interest in terms of how to make more sustainable and inclusive cities for the future. Um, just briefly, in terms of what I'm going to go through, uh, on the next slide, I, I, I'm kind of starting out with what I'm labeling here yesterday's futures. And so for me, it's really crucial to get to go back in time and to try and look at and to try and understand the ways in which different groups, different individuals, uh, urban discourse essentially, of the 1950s, 1960s, roughly speaking, looked at and projected the future. And I'll talk about that in a second. Uh, I'll move on then to look at current urbanist discourse and context, and kind of bringing in kind of some of the discussions around the 15 min minute city. Uh, then moving on from this, look at some of the tensions between urbanism uh, and urbanization. And so kind of try to tease out some of these kind of challenges that the processes of urbanization bring about in terms of how we think about urbanism, how we might think about reshaping cities in the future. Uh, and then finally, and grounding this in, in some of the current dis discourses, and this is drawing on work with Carla Kayanen uh, in, in Minute University about kind of uh, so urban futures, looking at the context of city edge uh, and, and the, the desired transformation uh, of the area around Nace Road for, for the next sort of 50 years, essentially, uh, and looking at and, and kind of questioning and wondering what type of future urban space this might be if it goes ahead according to the current and recent plan, I should say. Uh, 
and then I'll just finish up with a, with a quick summary and then hopefully open up to discussion. And so in a way, and, and this kind of comes back to, to my training, what, what I'm interested in here overall, if I could just try to kind of uh, situate where I'm going with this, we're, you know, as, as an urban researcher, as somebody who's engaged in what might be labeled as critical or urban discourse or critical or urban debates, I'm interested to know what the city is and what the city might be. And so I think sometimes it's important to make that clear at the beginning, because I know that I'm talking to various different people with different sets of interests, different sets of training and background. And so really very often what we're trying to do is, is, is promote different forms of kind of questioning around urban space. Uh, and so, you know, I think probably it's fair to say with the diversity of different talks that John is de has developed over the last number of weeks, there's different kind of perspectives being brought forward. And so I'm very much grounded in this sort of questioning around, well, what is it fundamentally that we're talking about? And that's a, a really crucial question in terms of how we might reshape our cities of the future. OK, so I've labeled this, as I said, uh, yesterday's futures. Um, again, a little bit of context, and as I work forward, hopefully kind of the back and forth between uh, some of what you'll see on these slides will begin to make sense. As I mentioned on the last slide, I've been interested for quite a long time in terms of urbanist discourse. Uh, and as I'll go on to detail in the next slide, we see a significant shift roughly in the 1980s, 1990s, in terms of the treatment of urban central areas. And so a renewed interest in public space, for example. Uh, and while a lot of my research over the last number of decades has, has looked at this, around the time of COVID, I became increasingly interested in some of the debates that prefigured those debates and looking back to the past for sort of strands that help us understand the current context. From a research perspective, what I'm trying to do is get past some of kind of the labeling that's often used to describe or to try and understand particular moments in time. And while we can you know, kind of say, well, there's a certain juncture at a particular moment in time. I'm also interested to see kind of the tentative emergence of particular discourses and how they begin to emerge and then how they take hold. Uh, and so for me, going back to the past is really, really crucial. It's really crucial for me as a researcher in terms of understanding our current moment. And that's one of the key things that I try to do. But also, and this is something that I was really, I suppose, prompted to try and think about a little bit through, you know, when John uh, asked me to talk today, for me, it's really essential to understand the future that's coming. And so by going back in the past, we can get a sense of how different individuals, different groups essentially foresaw the future, foresaw what might be coming down the line, tried to push forward a particular ideal of the city, how that did or didn't take hold. And so one of the things that I've been looking at is some of the debates, particularly a US, you know, US based, but glo global and remit in, in essence, around kind of ideas of, of, of blight. And, and some of these are quite, you know, what we see now is kind of quite racially charged kind of sets of languages. Blights, slums are where my focus is lay on the notion of the gray areas. So these areas that were deemed by different individuals, people working in policy, people working in uh, sociology at the time and planning and so on, how they debated these areas that were seen not necessarily kind of in full decline, but potentially going towards what they described as a form of terminal decline. And so one kind of key individual here, and this is the image of Boston that you see on the right hand side of the screen, uh, so the way in which these places were spoken about is of interest for me at the moment. And so these spaces, these gray areas of the city, and in this case, he's talking about the area in the bottom right at the south end of Boston. So these so-called gray areas were perceived to be these areas of terminal decline. They were taking into account, for example, about 40 or 50 years of large scale suburbanization at this stage. And so a discourse started to emerge about what the future held for these spaces. So people like Kevin Lynch, for example, well-known urbanists of the time, spoke about how these spaces might be reused. Various different kind of ideas emerged, future of helipads, airports, and so on. The key message essentially was, was that at that time, early on in these debates in the late 1950s, there was a sort of a notion essentially that these spaces would be removed. However, what we start to see in and around the same time, and this is what's interesting for me, is how the same term could be used to describe a number of different options. We see a num another set of debates emerge. 
And so this sort of notion emerging through well-known figures such as Jane Jacobs, for example, talking about how the central area or more accurately those neighborhoods around central areas might be transformed. And so we see a kind of a re-emergence of a, a discourse of the central city, a kind of a desire to get back to what was perceived to have been lost. And so for me, what we start, start to see in this context essentially is a reappraisal of cities, a tentative reappraisal of cities, the emergence of what's now referred to as walkability of people living in central areas, walking to work and so on. But this beginnings of a kind of a tentative shift became a dominant part of urban discourse from the 1970s onwards. So ideas of placemaking, for example, can, can, can kind of link them, can be linked to this period of time. Of course, they can be linked to earlier times. And in a sense, there was a kind of a harking back to the city that was pre the industrial city of the 19th and 20th century. And so again, and working in tension, on the one hand, we see this desire to shift back to the center, linking in with gentrification, for example. But then at the same time, we see large scale urbanization take hold at a global scale. And so one of the messages from this period before I move on, essentially, is, is that while on the one hand, there was this notion of the future being this kind of dispersed kind of urban pattern, and there was this sort of discourse at the time merging through Melvin Weber, for example, of communications enhancing and aiding in this transformation where people could live in various different spaces, but be connected via form of kind of telecommunications that would enhance communica community from this perspective. What we've seen in reality, I would argue, is both. So on the one hand, you know, the dominance of the center in terms of urban discourse, but at the same time, this mass scale suburbanization. And so these things are intention, whether it be in terms of investment and discourses around investment, or whether it be in terms of discourses of ways of life and so on. Where this leads us to, essentially, and to try and put kind of urbanist discourse in context. And so when we think about the latest iteration, so Moreno and his 15 minute city, we need to situate it within roughly 50 years of urbanist thinking on what I've labeled here as time and space. And one of the things that kind of interests me, and I'll, I'll go through this slide and try to go through it a little bit more carefully, is that very often in, in terms of current debates, whether it be popular current debates that appear in various online journals, various online magazines, is this sort of notion of this urbanist ideal of the city as being this rejection of the city of the past, the city of the 20th century. And it's very often, and one of the things, and one of my frustrations in this, is the ways in which it labels the Le Corbusier city as being kind of the bete noir, so to speak, of urbanization. So it takes one particular ideal of the city, it takes Le Corbusier's ideal of the city as being kind of where the blame for our current problems lay. And this, as I say, appears in various different iterations. One which I was recently critical of is the Quito Papers. So a, a kind of a, a, a publication that emerges in the context of the new urban agenda in 2016 and is published then in 2018, and where Richard Sennett, Saskia Sasson, and a number of other authors essentially lay the blame at the feet of Le Corbusier for the urban, urban challenges of the moment. And so as something I'll try to get into as I go into this talk is the way in which kind of urbanist discourse sometimes lays, what is another urbanist discourse, lays the blame at these other way of thinking about the city. Whereas for me, a lot of our challenges are about the uncontrollability of the processes of urbanization. They're not at the feet of some iteration or some ideal of the city inherited from the past. Another important point in this, and this is something that again, I've been interested in recently, is that while very often there might be a tendency to see the forms of transformation that we're talking about Acting, up, acting in a kind of a linear fashion, our ideals being influenced in this kind of linear fashion. And so on the one hand, we can link, for example, the 15 minute city back to different kind of iterations of post 1970s urbanism, whether it be new urbanism of the 1990s or the creative class of more recent years. But there's also a really interesting overlap here with the, with the neighborhood unit from 1929. And I find even the use of the circle here really interesting and quite fascinating as well. 
And so the point about the 15 minute city at the moment, and some of you will be very much familiar with this, but this sort of notion of our everyday lives being lived out in the context of and have been reachable within 15 minutes, within 15 minutes, being able to essentially learn, as it says in this diagram, work, share, and so on within this context has become a kind of a key element in current urbanist discourse. But this is essentially a follow on from a significant time period of what we might be labeled as urbanism, uh, as I said earlier on, the ideals of new urbanism, placemaking, a lot of which have their origins, I would argue, in 1960s, 1970s discourse. Some of you may also be familiar with an interesting critique and one that for me is very dubious that has emerged essentially on the right. And this sort of notion of the 15 minute city neighborhood kind of uh, cajoling people in and people becoming prisoners of their own neighborhood. And just to be clear, that's not where my critique here is coming from. It's also really important to say that, you know, in essence, when I'm trying to look at these ideas and looking at them from a critical perspective, it's not so much the 15 minute city itself that I'm critical of, but for me, essentially, it's about situating some of these discussions and some of these debates in terms of their longer term context. So, as I said, the 15 minute city can be linked in with the ideals of new urbanism, new urbanism emerging, particularly in the context of the US, albeit via, for example, Prince or now King Charles's example of Panbury, are directly influenced by the ideals of new urbanism. And so new urbanism as a desire also directly influenced by the neighborhood unit, but also trying to hark back to what was perceived to be a lost past. And so urbanism in this context for me is always fighting against and always, always battling against the un seeming uncontrollability of these processes of urbanization. And so there's a lot to be admired in terms of what's being put forward. Walkability is always at the center of this. Healthier lives is always at the center of this. And so when we move through these various different iterations, we can see essentially the different attributes of these urbanist ideals, traffic reduction, cycling, health benefits, and so on. We can also look at this in terms of kind of a greater depth. And so while I'm connecting together new urbanism, the creative class and the 15 minute city, there are of course key differences within this, but it's those overlaps that are of interest. And so the creative city emerging in the early 20th century, but again, growing upon and reinforcing already existing ideals from the previous 20, if not 30 years, situating new forms of work around creativity as being embedded within these central spaces. And so at the heart of these urbanist remakings of space is always this sort of notion of reinventing the center, reinventing how people live their lives in the center. And there's an interesting difference in terms of the 15 minute city from what I would see as its predecessors. It's different from the creative class in as much as it doesn't explicitly focus on one particular group or one set of kind of individuals. And this is something that perhaps we could tease out further in, in the discussion. We have to kind of go underneath the surface to try and understand exactly who this is about, or we have to look at the way in which it's layered on to different examples in order to understand this. The key thing, the key way in which I would argue it's different from the new urbanist focus on, you know, this sort of walkability of the quarter of a mile, half a mile, and so on, is through this focus on time from Moreno. And so it's a really clever use of these three words. It compresses such complex issues into these three words, the 15 minute city. What's not, in a sense, to like about this? What's not like, what's not to like about being able to walk within your neighborhood, to have a, a safer feeling neighborhood for children or for adults as well. What's not to like about being able to walk to work and so on. And so my critique of these elements are these, these ideals is not so much in terms of what they're trying to achieve, but in essence it's about how they become layered on to existing realities and some of the challenges around that. And so for me there are key challenges in terms of the 15 minute city in terms of existing politics in particular places, existing strategies of land use, existing urban governance issues. And so how these things essentially take hold in different contexts is essentially largely dictated by these factors. So context really, really matters. And so as I say at the bottom here, the placement of what are seemingly straightforward ideals onto a complex system raises significant challenges. 
And so the 15 minute city are, and I'm, you know, to be clear, I'll try to kind of broaden out here. It's not so much that I'm critiquing the 15 minute city per se, but I'm interested in wider social and political challenges around this. So in short, I'm interested in how these things can be mapped on to existing challenges around urbanization as well. And so, and again, going back to kind of debates and, and to broaden out the debate beyond just the 15 minute city. And so on the one hand, and again, over the last number of years, the last 20 years or so, we've seen a sort of a tendency. And to be clear, I'm talking here, I'm gonna talk through density, intensity, and urbanization through this slide. And when I talk about density, I'm not just talking about a simple kind of bricks and mortars reading of density. And just to be clear, I think that there is a lot to be said for these readings, so long as they are contextualized in terms of wider social and political processes. But nevertheless, for me, there's a kind of an issue in terms of the ways in which very often debates around this become re reduced to a kind of a list-like or celebratory kind of notion of one place being denser than the other without actually looking at and trying to understand what it is that we mean by density. And so the tendency is to draw upon various different European examples, and particularly in an Irish context, as being denser than Dublin or being denser than other Irish cities. And so what do we do with this? How do we understand what it is that we're talking about here? Why is it that we're always talking from a media perspective just around density as this almost moral good? Why don't we ever look at the detail of this? What is going on in these neighborhoods that are supposedly denser than comparable neighborhoods in an Irish context? And again, this is not to kind of invoke a kind of a doom kind of phrase around density or not to associate it with poverty as it was, and just to be clear again, in the past, but to look at and to understand what it is that we mean by density in different contexts, how we understand density in relation to various different strategies, various different policies, various different structures of governance in different cities. At the same time, and so this is often kind of emerges, as I said, in a kind of a celebratory manner, and, and uh, we see various different iterations of this, but one that I've looked at uh, in detail a number of years ago is via Monaco magazine, for example. And the European city very often kind of rises to the, to the top in this. So places like Helsinki, places like Munich, Copenhagen is, you could argue, over the last number of years, become kind of top of the pile in terms of trying to allude to and trying to promote various different things around placemaking. But at the same time, and particularly in the context of the, the sort of post-COVID, during COVID and then also in the post-COVID period, we see a kind of a shattering of some of these ideals, but in ways that I think are also slightly problematic. And uh, David Madden, uh, a colleague in the London School of Economics, has recently pushed back on what is also quite a recent debate on what he refers to as the kind of urban doom loop. And so there's been discussions, particularly again, in the context of the US of, of New York, for example, about the center being doomed, you know, about essentially businesses pulling out of the center. And in essence, that's a reading of what's going on in the context of the post COVID period, empty shops, retail space, and so on. At the same time, we see this sort of working from home, which was widely celebrated taking place. And all of this is reshaping cities in various different ways that I don't think we yet have a handle on. But in essence, and again, to pick up on David Madden's thoughts on this, which he re recently put forward in a curbed article, it also offers this opportunity to rethink what to rethink about what we mean by the center or what the center is. So rather than this sort of doom loop of businesses leaving the center, we could talk about trying to invest in central areas as being inclusive spaces, spaces for all, for reimagining what this what these central spaces are. And so those who kind of buy into this kind of doom like or urban doom loop, as Madden puts it, kind of approach, foresee that the city, the city in general, has come to this the end of what is perceived as a kind of a golden age. So this kind of urban renaissance of the 1990s and 2000s for these individuals has come to an age. For Madden, this offers the opportunity to rethink what the center is rather than just to go back to what are essentially has you know, is a repeat of some of the debates of the 1960s and 1970s about attracting industry, attracting business, and so on. And so in all of this, what we need to get a handle on, I would argue, and what I see as being intention, 
is wider urbanist discussions. So urbanism as a desire to mold space in a particular way, and these processes of urbanization. The sort of notion of working from home is going to challenge essentially the dominance of the center. And at the moment, we can see evidence of this. This raises essentially the prospect of thinking more thoroughly in terms of the challenges of urbanization. Urbanization as something that goes beyond the boundaries of the city. And here I'm picking up on some of the current debates on planetary urbanization, for example, the sort of notion of the city as being unbounded, moving beyond the city as just this reading of urbanization, urbanization as this much more complex set of processes that are planetary, that are global in reach. And so how we ground this in terms of everyday debates for me is a key challenge, but is a necessary one in terms of reaching a more sustainable, more socially inclusive urban future. And so for it, this is why I've used the second label here, that around intensity. And so rather than just thinking in straightforward language of density and the celebratory elements around that or the doom loop elements around that, we need to think about the sort of intensity, the city as this sort of intensive space where we see various different processes coming together. As I say here, it's a complex set of daily interactions. So material production, and one of the things that I would argue is lacking in terms of the 15 minute city is a discussion around material production. And it's explicit in terms of the various different articles, whether they be written by Moreno himself or whether they be written in response to what's going on. But there is essentially a lacking of discussion. So Johannes Novi has argued about this. There's a lack of discussion of production within the 15 minute city, of where things are actually materially produced. Because of this focus on time, we get this dominance of the digital, of working from home, of being able to live your life within these neighborhoods. And this, of course, was particularly kind of evident in the context of the period of COVID-19, but still has resonance as we go into the future. And so rather than just critiquing the 15-minute city a la the creative class as being only for one set of individuals or one group, as Richard Florida himself has done, so our Ed Glazer has done as well, we also need to think about the 15-minute city in terms of the productive forces of the city. And this is something that was lacking in earlier placemaking our urbanist ideals of the city as well. And so the city has more than just this space that you live in, in terms of your daily life, the dominance of kind of the daily rhythms that move beyond these kind of imaginaries. And so if we go back to the slide before, that neat circle of people living their daily lives in this context needs to be understood as a much more process-oriented reality for many people as they live out their lives. And so this brings us to the third point here, that of urbanization. And so urbanization as something that is much more than urbanist kind of iterations or urbanist ideals can grasp. And this again is something that I would be interested to hear further perspectives on. I'd be interested to hear essentially about how this can be grappled with. And so again, I'm talking about imaginaries of space. There is a dominance when we talk about silicone docks, in the example of Grand Canal Dock at the bottom of your screen here, to isolate, to bound these spaces. The discourse of these areas is dominant in terms of how we talk about cities in the current context. But how we broaden this scope, how we relate these spaces, these spaces in reality cannot be imagined without understanding their relationship to the wider processes of urbanization in which they are embedded. Whether that be at the scale of the urban region, and this is why I've used the example of the Google Data Center on Baldano Road, are in terms of wider processes at a global at a global scale. And so when we think about and when we try to understand essentially what's going on in terms of the contemporary city, I would argue that there is a limitation in terms of current urbanist discourse around what the city is. And if we want a more sustainable urban future, we have to think beyond what I would argue are very kind of narrow or sort of narrowly focused bounds of the city. And this, in terms of its current iteration, is exemplified through the example of the 15-minute city. But I wouldn't only place the blame there. There is a long history within urbanist discourse of doing this. And so in essence, we need a kind of a paradigm shift, I would argue, in terms of how we think about the urban. But this needs to go beyond some of the debates that are taking place within academia. This needs to go, be, go beyond and to understand essentially what's going on more generally in terms of the urban social fabric. 
And so just in terms of kind of a final point in terms of these debates, I'm interested essentially in terms of, well, what, what, in what way, if we try to imagine an urban future, if we try to imagine 50 years down the road, what type of cities might exist? What might they look like? What set of processes are going to change? What, what, what's the, what types of processes are going to emerge? Or how are processes going to shift? And how is that going to change the realities of cities on the ground? And so the sort of predominant, you know, kind of the reuse of industrial space a la the last sort of 30 or 40 years has taken on a new iteration. And so as central space has, in inverted commas, kind of run out, we see a shift in the discourse. And so we see a kind of a rescaling, essentially, in terms of the post-industrial city, a desire to use these spaces that have up until recently been largely ignored, along ways that are, albeit with slight differences, largely similar to what has been going on over the last 30 or 40 years. And so one of the things that has interested myself, uh, along with Carla Kayanen, as I said earlier on, has been the recent example of the City Edge project in Dublin. And to be clear, and this is where I'm coming from in these debates, I'm not opposed to the transformation that's taking place here. I'm fascinated by what it might entail, but I'd also kind of flag some of the, the difficulties or some of the challenges of transforming a space of this scale. For me, this transformation, and as I've outlined here in brief, so City Edge, for those of you who aren't familiar with this plan, essentially is a desire to transform the area around Ballymount into this new urban neighborhood. And so a desire to transform a kind of industrial and light industrial and logistical space into a new type of mixed use space. It's significant in terms of its scale, and it's going to take place over a number of decades, but 40,000 homes, 75,000 jobs is about 5,000 at the moment. And so there's a representation of this area as a space that is ripe for transformation. What does this mean in terms of the current uses? Where do they go? What does this mean in terms of urbanization? And so again, the discourse of urbanism and the desire essentially for compact urbanism has produced this desire to reuse what is in a way kind of the largest last remaining kind of space that isn't you know, kind of predominantly, you know, whether, you know, kind of post-industrial uses, so services economy, residential use, and so on. And so in a way, it's a residentialization or a desire essentially to remanufacture what this space is. It's not a total transformation. And to be fair to the policy documents, there's an outlining that it would be a kind of a form of industry uh, 4.0, a kind of a drawing upon its past in order to reinvent its future. The area at present is sort of labeled as a brownfields location, yet this area is crucial in terms of the day-to-day -day runnings of the city, whether it be in terms of storage, whether it be in terms of light or retail, whether it be in terms of essentially its function uh, as, as a storage area, whether, for, whether it be kind of trans modes of transport such as buses and so on. Recycling, you name it essentially is here. And so what we see essentially is, is a kind of a mixed use space in a way, but one that essentially there is a desire to remove or move to other parts of the city. And one way of thinking about the future might be that these types of uses change anyway, and therefore the space can be transformed. But there still remains questions about, well, how do they change? And will we not need these types of functions or functions that are similar to these in later years? At the same time, as we argue in a, a, a paper that's coming out in, in the near future, that there's a focus on the highest and best use. And this is where, and in the Irish context, we see a shift away from these kind of areas that it draws upon. So at Funen in Amsterdam, for example, or Nordhaven in Copenhagen. And so there's a focus on highest and best use. And so in the context, essentially, of the private ownership of land, the state needs to kind of approach it in a very particular way, it needs to encourage development, which is different in, through analysis of the various different debates and discussions over the last number of months. We see this difference emerge in terms of planners from Amsterdam planners from Copenhagen talking about their context, talking about the role of the state. And this is where we see the unique context of Dublin, of Ireland coming to the fore. And so we would argue that this raises significant challenges in terms of planning this space, in terms of how it might actually be transformed. If this is about the highest and best use, what starts to happen essentially is we see this rolling out of a kind of a contradictory type of social environment. 
So who has the power to change this and in this space and in what manner? And so in terms of these wider debates, the political is always central in terms of the ways in which transformation might take place. So in summary, and again, I, I welcome uh, further discussion and, uh, around some of the things that I've raised. And so for me, the challenges of the city of the future and so for, I've kind of tried to outline this through kind of some of the ways in which placemaking or urbanism, you know, through the example of the 50 minute city and that which went before, can be dominated by a kind of a functionalist reductionism. And so what I mean by this is the ways in which we, and in a way it's acceptable, but the ways in which it just ro rotates or it revolves, I should say, around mobility, for example. And very often there's a lack of attention to the meanings of place. This is something that gets lost what are these places? What, are, what meanings do these places have that goes outside this kind of reduction to kind of an imaginary of people being mobile or going around their daily business through these kind of iterations or through these imaginaries? And so we need to move beyond this, I would argue. Land use as a social process. Land use as something more than just a sort of technical kind of transformation. We need to think about the relationship between land material production to pick up on Johannes Novi's work and consu consumption as essential elements in a different type of urbanization and in a different type of city. And so when we talk about urbanism, when we talk about urbanization, we can't just talk around it in isolated, in an isolated sense. And so at the same time as the 15 minute city is being invoked, we see this sort of distribution center, the fulfillment center being developed on the outskirts of, this, of the city, the Amazon fulfillment center. Where are the different element parts coming into this from? How does it spread its tentacles in terms of the very processes of urbanization? And this is why this element, understanding these, understanding urbanization as a process is essential in terms of understanding how we might remake our cities. And then the challenges of urbanization. And so in essence, and in summary, any shift in our attitudes towards climate and our broader relationship to the planet is to bear in mind that this shift would ultimately require a resultant shift in the very essence of what urbanization is and what the city is. And in essence, what I'm trying to get across here, as I summarized this there a minute ago, is, is that if we really want to transform the city, we can't just think about it in terms of consumption, as very often placemaking and urbanist discourse does, but think about it in relation to broader material production, whether at the local level, the regional level, or at a global level. I'll leave it there. Thanks very much. Thank you very much, Phil. Uh, very thought provoking. Um, you introduced a lot of new information for, for me, uh, who would consider himself reasonably uh, well read in this space, but a uh, very, very uh, enjoyable uh, talk. Um, uh, just as always, uh, Phil's work, his research, the programs he leads on can be accessed through Trinity website, through the courses and research um, and reach out if there's anything. Uh, we're on a break for Easter next week, so there is no session next week. But in a fortnight, uh, a colleague of, of Phil's from uh, Geography, uh, Professor uh, Quentin Crowley from the Centre for the Environment, will be talking systems innovation and sustainability and climate action. So uh, the, the importance of innovation in, in delivering climate action. Uh, is, is so key. So as always, we record these sessions and so you can enjoy uh, Phil's talk um, and share it with others and it'll be available in the coming days. And please sign up for future sessions to ensure you keep track of all of this information. As always, thank you very much for joining this Wednesday lunchtime. Hope you have two minutes now to as a breather before you get back to work. And uh, Phil, once again, thank you very much for joining this this afternoon. Thanks and welcome anybody who wants to contact me or anything like that. So. Thanks, Phil, and thanks, everyone. Thanks, John.